I'm Suzanne Wasserman. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History. This is our second to last spring forum, history forum. Please join us in three weeks on May 9th at 6.30 right here for our last Gotham Forum this spring. Graham Hodges is coming from Colgate University to discuss his book, New York City Cartmen, 1667 to 1850. The Cartmen, unskilled workers who hauled goods on one-horse carts, were perhaps the most important labor group in early American cities. Revised and reissued in 2012, New York City Cartman 1667 to 1850, which is published by NYU Press, uncovers the forgotten world of one horse cart drivers who monopolized the movement of private and commercial goods in New York City from 1667 until 1850. The Cartman dominated the city streets while proving politically adept at preserving and institutionalizing their economic and racial control over this entry-level occupation. The Cartman possessed a hard-nosed political awareness, and because they transported essential goods, they achieved a status in New York City far above their skills or financial worth. The Cartman's culture and their relationship with New York's municipal government are the direct ancestors of the city's fabled taxicab drivers. And those of you who know Graham Hodges know that he also wrote a book about cab drivers. This is a stirring street-level account of the growth of New York, growth made possible by the efforts of the Cartman and, and other unskilled laborers. But tonight, we're, I'm very pleased to welcome Matthew Goodman. He's the author of two previous books of nonfiction, The Sun and the Moon, The Remarkable True Account of Hoaxers, Showmen, Dueling Journalists, and Lunar Batman, Batman Bats in 19th Century New York and Jewish Food, The World at Table. His new book, 80 Days, Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bislin's History-Making Race Around the World, published by Ballantine Books, is being translated into eight languages. Barnes & Noble chose 80 Days as a Discover Great New Writers selection and named it as one of its 10 best books of the month. It was also selected as an indie next, next Great Reads book by Indie Bound, the consortium of independent bookstores nationwide. Publishers Weekly called the book, quote, a stimulating life, true life adventure, and, and, quote, an absorbing travel epic that conveys the exuberant dynamism of a very unfussy Victorian era with speed, power, publicity, and the breaking of every barrier, end quote. An Indie Next Great Read selection, a USA Today new and notable book, a Parade Magazine top pick, an iTunes Best Book of the Month, an Amazon Best History Book of the Month, and a, and a Book Browse Editor's Choice, not to mention a New York Times national bestseller. Matthew lives with his wife and two children in Brooklyn, not far from the site of the old Nellie Bly Amusement Park. My best-selling friend and colleague, Matthew Goodman. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, this is my last, uh, as far as I know, my last event for this book, and I could not think of a nicer place to have it than uh, here at the Gotham Center, whose work I so admire, and I want to thank Suzanne, my, my, my dear friend, for, for having me. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about this book, 80 Days, Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bislin's History Making Race Around the World. If I were to ask how many people here had heard of Nellie Bly, I'm guessing that probably most people had heard of her. Okay, you can raise your hand if you like. Okay, that's, that's most of the crowd. If I were going to ask how many people had heard of Elizabeth Bisland before, I, I'm guessing I would have gotten zero. I do have zero uh, people uh, saying that they had. Uh, I've been working on this book for about four years, and, and during that time I would say to people, I'm writing a book about... Nellie Bly, and they would say, oh, that's great, Nellie Bly. And then invariably they'd say, wait, who, who is Nellie Bly again? Nobody could, could quite place who she was. Nellie Bly is a person who people seem almost to know. You know, that probably you've read a book about her in fourth grade or fifth grade, one of these uh, young adult books designed to present uh, female, plucky female role models for, for young girls. But, you know, as the decades go by, you're not quite sure. Was she a journalist or was she, uh, the founder of the Girl Scouts or was she a worker on the Underground Railroad or was she, uh, a suffragette? You know, she was something good. You knew that she was something good, but you're not quite sure exactly who she was. 
And that was pretty much the case for, for me as well. I, I, I knew she was a journalist. And as Suzanne mentioned, um, I live not far from the site of the old, some of you Brooklynites might remember this, the, the old Nellie Bly amusement park. So I knew her as the namesake of this amusement park, but I didn't know much else about her. And then when I began researching, uh, looking around for the next book, and I, I saw a reference to Nellie Bly, and I began to uh, explore who she was, I found out that she was indeed a journalist, but not just any journalist, that she was really an amazing journalist, that she was a female journalist unlike any that New York had ever seen before her. Uh, she was at a time when women were almost invariably relegated to the women's page of the newspapers. Uh, you know, this was a time in 1890, uh, there were more than 12,000 newspaper re reporters in America. Of those, more than 12,000, fewer than 300 were women. And of those uh, fewer than 300, almost all of them worked on the women's page um, of the newspapers. Uh, that was the page where, you know, if you wanted to find out the proper sequence of brown and white sauces in a formal dinner, that's where you went to the women's page of the newspaper, where women learned about shopping and about recipes and about child rearing and so forth. Um, at that time, when uh, the women's page of the newspaper was really where women reporters were, Nellie Bly was an undercover investigative reporter for Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, The World, which was the largest and most widely read newspaper um, in the country. She adamantly refused to write for the women's page of the newspaper. And when her previous employer, the Pittsburgh Dispatch, assigned her to the women's page, she quit rather than uh, be forced to work um, on the women's page. She was an undercover investigative reporter. Uh, her very first expose for the world, she, in her very first expose, she went undercover. She feigned madness. She pretended to be insane in order to get herself committed to the Blackwell's Island Lunatic Asylum, which is today what we call Roosevelt Island, um, in order to experience um, at first hand the horrors endured by the female patients um, in that asylum. It was a tremendously courageous act because once she got in, it was not at all clear that she was ever going to get back out. And it took all of Joseph Pulitzer's doing, in fact, to get her back out. Uh, but she endured her time there. And when she got back out, she wrote a series of articles exposing the conditions in the asylum and uh, changed, uh, reformed the conditions uh, as a result. That was the kind of story that Nellie Bly did. Uh, in another story, she pretended to be the wife of a pharmaceuticals maker so that she could expose a corrupt uh, Albany lobbyist a guy called the Lobby King of Albany, and he was exposed and was forced to uh, to leave Albany. He was fortunately uh, the last corrupt lobbyist in uh, the history of, of Albany. Nellie Bly got rid of that. Uh, that's a joke I can make at this, for this crowd. When I'm in Cincinnati, I can't, I can't make that joke. But, but you all know that there have there been no more corrupt Albany lobbyists since 1887. Uh, but again, that was the kind of story that Nellie Bly did. She pretended to be uh, a young mother to see if she could sell her baby on the black market. It turned out she could. She went to a medical dispensary for the poor, uh, where she very narrowly escaped having her taunt, perfectly healthy tonsils removed by some, some quack there. So that was the kind of thing um, that she did. But in the fall of 1889, she undertook her most audacious uh, adventure yet, which was her attempt to go around the world faster than anyone ever had in history, to try to beat in real life the mark of 80 days set by Phileas Fogg and Jules Verne's popular novel in the time around the world um, in 80 days. So when I discovered that, uh, I was really amazed, uh, and I was captivated by the notion of this young woman by herself, speaking only English, and by the way, carrying only a single bag, attempting to go around the world faster than anyone ever had before her. Um, on the topic of the single bag, uh, you know, when she went, it was her idea to, to, to do this. She had, it was in fact a year earlier, she had gone to the editors of the world 
and said, I want to go around the world faster than anyone has ever done it before. And, and she was told adamantly, no. George M. Turner, the business manager of the world, said to her, only a man can do this. And Nellie Bly said, very well, you send your man and I will start for another paper and I will beat him. That's the way that Nellie Bly was. Um, but part of the reason why she was told no, I mean, this was a time, of course, when male newspaper editors didn't even like their female reporters to go across the city unchaperoned by a man, much less around the world. You know, women reporters weren't supposed to go out by themselves at night. They weren't supposed to go out by themselves in the rain. Uh, much less go all the way around the world by themselves, you know, encountering all four seasons and, and so forth in, uh, uh, by themselves. But the other reason that was given by the editor was, you know, you're a woman, and to undertake a trip like this, you will need to carry, oh, uh, 11 steamer trunks uh, in order to carry all of the ball gowns and various accoutrements that you're going to need for a trip around the world. This was the, you know, the generally... Uh, agreed upon convention of the time that a woman reporter is going to have, or a woman is going to have to carry this much baggage. The leading travel guide for women at the time, written by a guy named Thomas Knox, uh, advised female ship's passengers that they should bring into the ship, uh, the stateroom of the ship, a small steamer trunk as well as a satchel, and then they should ha also bring a large steamer trunk to put uh, in the hold of the ship to carry what they would need for their fortnight uh, in Europe. Uh, that steamer trunk was supposed to measure at its base 14 square feet. That was the recommendation um, of Thomas Knox. Nellie Bly carried a single bag, a hand uh, uh, handbag, measuring at its base 16 by 7 inches. And in that bag, she brought everything that she would need for a two-and-a-half-month trip around the world. That bag, by the way, the actual bag is on display in Washington at the museum, the wonderful uh, Museum of Journalistic History. It's, it's amazingly tiny. It is far smaller than all of the carry-on luggage that we all schlep onto airplanes for a single overnight stay in, you know, wherever it might be. That was her bag. She did it because she wanted to reduce her trip to its most efficient form. She wanted to go as fast as she possibly could, and also because she wanted to give the lie to the, this general idea that a woman needed to carry more bags than a man uh, in order to, to travel. So on November 14th, 1889, she set out from, uh, from Hoboken by way of the steamship Augusta Victoria heading to London to begin her trip around the world. So I was captivated by this. But I began to uh, research the story a little bit more, and I discovered something even more astonishing, which was that on the very same day, another young female journalist working for a rival publication by the name of Elizabeth Bisland also set out to beat around the world in 80 days, to beat Nellie Bly. And this was someone who had been totally dropped out of the historical record. I had never heard of her. And I was just amazed and captivated by the notion of these two rival young female journalists, one heading east, one heading west, each of them trying to beat around the world in 80 days. Um, it, as it turned out for me, also, what was really lucky was that these two young women, while very similar in the fact that they were both kind of pioneering young female journalists, were by temperament and character so different. Uh, Nellie Bly was this kind of scrappy, tough-talking, ambitious, fiercely determined uh, investigative reporter, she came from Pennsylvania coal country, western Pennsylvania. She always sought out the most sensational news stories. Elizabeth Bisland, as it turned out, was, uh, had been born in Louisiana. She had been born and raised on a ruined sugarcane plantation in Louisiana, ruined by the Civil War. She was a great lover of literature. She was a poet. She was an essayist, a beautiful writer. She um, had taught herself to read by, with these 
tattered, burned volumes of Cervantes and Shakespeare that she had discovered in the library of the plantation of her grandfather's plantation. She taught herself French while she churned butter on the plantation so that she could read Rousseau's confessions in the original French. That was the way she was, this really remarkable, incredibly erudite uh, young woman who, who, like Nellie Bly, had come to New York with $50 in her pocket to make her way in the male-dominated world of uh, newspaper journalism. Her first job interview was at The Sun. She had a meeting with the Chester Lord, the famous a uh, newspaper editor, and she told him that she wanted to work there, and he said to her, my dear little girl, pack your bag and go home. This is no place for you. Uh, but she was determined, and eventually she was uh, became quite well respected as a, a writer uh, and essayist in New York. She was genteel. She was widely referred to as the most beautiful woman in metropolitan journalism. Men were constantly falling in love with her. Rudyard Kipling fell in love with her, among others. Um, she hosted a tea, a tea salon for uh, New York's literati in her little apartment on Fourth Avenue. Nellie Bly, on the other hand, was a regular at O'Rourke's Saloon on the Bowery. So you have two very, very different women. Um, and this was reflected in their attitudes towards the race as well. It, this was Nellie Bly, the race was Nellie Bly's idea, and she had to fight for it. Um, Elizabeth Bisland uh, didn't learn about it until that day. What, it ha what happened was that the world was using this trip as a uh, publicity device because the world's circulation had been going up and up and up, and then suddenly it started to go back down. And when it started to go back down, the world's editors... Um, were looking for a way to boost circulation, and they sent for Nellie Bly, and they said, can you leave on your trip around the world in six days? And Nellie Bly said, I can start this minute um, if you need me to. That was the way Nellie Bly was. That morning, the morning she left, the world, of course, had an article trumpeting Nellie Bly, star world reporter Nellie Bly leaves on trip around the world. And one of the people who read it was the publisher of the Cosmopolitan magazine, a guy named John Brisbane Walker. The Cosmopolitan was his very high-toned monthly magazine, uh, which would later be bought by William Randolph Hearst and later be taken over by Helen Gurley Brown and become Cosmo magazine, uh, but it was a very different journal back then. There were no sex quizzes for women in 1889. It was a very high-toned magazine. But John Brisbane Walker, who had, who had come from out west, and he had already made a fortune in alfalfa, and then he had made a fortune in iron, and he was about to make a third fortune in publishing because he understood the value of free publicity. And he immediately recognized when he read this article the value, uh, the, the potential value of having the Cosmopolitan send its own young female journalist to beat Nellie Bly. And he thought that she could go faster if she went in the opposite direction, if she went west rather than east. So he arrived at his office that morning right on Madison Square Park, and he sent for his literary editor, the beautiful young um, Elizabeth Bisland. Bisland was 28, by the way. Nellie Bly was 25. Uh, although she claimed she was 22, but she was actually 25. Uh, so Elizabeth Bislin shows up at Brisbane Walker's office at 11 o'clock that morning. John Brisbane Walker bades her a cordial good day and then says, tonight at 6 p.m., you will be on a, a New York Central Railroad train heading west for San Francisco. And from there, I would like you to proceed the rest of the way around the world. And if at all possible, please do this faster than anyone ever has done this before you. Uh, Bisland is shocked. She's chagrined. And she says, no. She says, I won't do this. She says, I have people coming for dinner. Uh, I, I have nothing to wear for such a trip. Uh, but the real reason, as she acknowledged later, was that she, she was very, very bright. And she was a very serious writer, and she, and she understood immediately the kind of sensation that would be attached to a story like this, which Nellie Bly loved. Nellie Bly wanted her name not just in the byline, but in the headline of the stories. So the headline of the story would be, Nellie Bly learns to ride a bicycle. That would be the headline of the story. Uh, Elizabeth Bisland, when she returned to New York, wrote that she wished to live her life in such a way that her name would never again appear in a newspaper headline. That's the way Elizabeth Bisland was. So she said no. But 
uh, Brisbane Walker, John Brisbane Walker was not someone who uh, was easily dissuaded. And that evening at six o'clock, she was on a New York Central Railroad train heading west for San Francisco. And so the race began. Um, this is a work of history. Uh, everything in it is true to the best of my, my knowledge. Uh, Everything in it that is between quotation marks, every bit of dialogue is taken from a written source, such as a newspaper article or, uh, or a diary or a letter or something like that, uh, and then is uh, cited um, at the back. There's 40 pages of endnotes at the back of the book. Uh, if I say it rained on a particular day, it rained on that particular day. I didn't change the arrival times of ships to make the race more dramatic than, uh, than it already was. Uh, I won't tell you who won, but I will say that it was neck and neck right up to the very end. Um, so it's a work of history, but having said that, it's a work of narrative history, by which I mean that uh, I wanted it to have all of the immediacy, all of the emotional impact, the vividness of a novel. Uh, I wanted readers not just to know what had happened on this race, but to feel what had happened on this race, so that you can feel what it was like to be sailing down the uh, Suez Canal on a moonlit night, or barreling through the French Alps on a railroad train, or, or being carried on the back of a rickshaw through the crowded streets of Hong Kong, as they both were, uh, or, or to meet Jules Verne in his estate in Amiens, France, which Nellie Bly uh, actually did. So with that, I'll just, I'll just read one page, one and a half pages, uh, just to give a flavor of the book. And then uh, I'll finish up. So this is just the, this is just the very the very beginning of the book. Uh, it's November fourteenth, eighteen eighty nine, Hoboken, New Jersey. She was a young woman in a plaid coat and cap, neither tall nor short, dark nor fair, not quite pretty enough to turn a head. The sort of woman who could, if necessary, lose herself in a crowd. Even in the chill early morning hours, the deck of the ferry from New York to Hoboken was packed tight with passengers. The Hudson River, or the North River as it was still called then, the name a vestige of the Dutch era, was as busy as any of the city's avenues, and the ferry carefully navigated its way through the water traffic, past the brightly painted canal boats and the workaday tugs, the flat-bottomed steam barges full of Pennsylvania coal, three-masted schooners with holds laden with tobacco and indigo and bananas and cotton, hides from Argentina and tea from Japan, with everything it seemed that the world had to offer. The young woman struggled to contain her nervousness as the ferry drew ever closer to the warehouses and depots of Hoboken, where the Hamburg American steamship Augusta Victoria already waited in her berth. Seagulls circled above the shoreline, sizing up the larger ships they would follow across the sea. In the distance, the massed stone spires of New York rose like cliffs from the water. Dockside, the minutes before the departure of an ocean-going liner always had something of a carnival air. Most of the men were dressed in dark top coats and silk hats. The women wore outfits made complicated by bustles and ruching. On the edges of the crowd, peddlers hawked goods that passengers might have neglected to pack. Sweating, bare-armed stevedores performed their ballet of hoisting and loading around the ropes and barrels that cluttered the pier. The rumble of carts on cobblestones blended with a general hubbub of conversation, the sound like thunder seeming to come at once from everywhere and nowhere. Somewhere inside the milling crowd stood the young woman in the plaid coat. She had been born Elizabeth Jane Cochran, though she was known to her family and her old friends not as Elizabeth or as Jane, but as Pink. To many of New York's newspaper readers, and shortly to those of much of the world, her name was Nellie Bly. So, so that was the morning, November 14th, 1889. Nellie Bly setting off east by way of the Augusta Victoria for London. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Bisland heading west by way of railroad to San Francisco. Um, it was a race that would take two and a half months and would captivate the United States and much of the world besides. Um, for me, it was exciting because you have these two wonderfully dynamic, very different female characters. 
the opportunity to describe places like Port Said and Hong Kong and the Suez Canal and uh, Ceylon in the year 1889, but also because the race allowed, uh, allowed me to explore larger issues, uh, larger historical issues uh, of, of race, of class, of changing social roles of women, of technology, and so forth. Um, there was no way to write the book without talking about the changing social roles of women. Elizabeth Bisland and Nellie Bly were emblematic of the changing social roles of women in the late Victorian era. They traveled around the world by steamship and by railroad, the two most powerful technologies of their time. They sent back messages to their editors by means of the telegram, this incredibly revolutionary technology, kind of the internet of its time. You know, This was a time when people were really kind of blown away by the idea that you could be in Hong Kong and send a message back to New York that could get there in five minutes. Five minutes. I mean, up to that point, you would have to send a letter and it would take weeks to get back. Uh, you know, the, the, the telegraph was the internet of its time. People had, you know, there were conferences about the impact of the telegraph. People wrote poems about the telegraph. Uh, the telegraph had, you know, newspapers were now called the Daily Telegraph. The Daily Telegram as a way to indicate the speediness of their news gathering operations. The Telegraph was said to quote Kipling, to have annihilated space and time. Um, they traveled across the country on the Transcontinental Railroad, which had recently been built by Chinese immigrant laborers who were not being allowed to become United States citizens. Uh, it's difficult to overstate the power and influence of the railroad companies at that time. Um, they had changed the landscape of the country. They had changed our conceptions of time itself. You know, up until the late 19th century, individual communities were allowed to set their own time uh, according to the, the passage of the sun overhead. This was known as local mean time. And so you would have a lot of different time zones within a particular area. Wisconsin had, thir there were 38 time zones in Wisconsin alone. Uh, when, the, when the clock struck noon in Washington, it was 12.08 in Philadelphia, it was 12.14 in New York, and it was 12.24 in Boston. Uh, in the Pittsburgh Railroad Station had six clocks, and each one of them showed a different time. Uh, the B&O Railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, ran its eastern trains by Baltimore time, its Ohio trains by Columbus time, and its western trains by the time of Vincennes, Indiana. Uh, this was an, an impossible way to run a railroad. And what happened was that in 1883, the leaders of the, the largest railroad companies got together in Chicago and created what they called the General Time Convention, where they agreed that they would now divide the country into four zones corresponding to the, the median times of Philadelphia, Memphis, Denver, and Fresno, the eastern, central, Rocky Mountain, and western time zones. Uh, this was done entirely on their own, without the consent of the president, without the consent of Congress, without the consent of the courts, but it quickly became the law of the land. And on November uh, 16th, 1883, six years, almost exactly six years to the day before Bly and Bislin took off, uh, clocks across the country were all changed to reflect uh, the new time. That day, that Sunday, was known as the day with two noons because clocks across the country were all being changed to uh, railroad time. We were now all living and dying by railroad time. That was the convention by which Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland uh, we're operating and is the one that we're still um, using today. Um, so the power of the railroads, the power of class, they traveled on, on uh, first class in uh, uh, these luxury steamships. Nowhere else on earth was the power of class more evident than on the deck of a luxury steamship. Um, and finally, and I'll just uh, allude to this briefly, the power of celebrity. This was the moment in the United States when we're first beginning to see the, the first inklings of celebrity culture. This is the moment when American companies are first beginning to understand that if they associated their product with a famous person, then all of the qualities associated with that person would seem to be reflected in the product itself. 
Um, and by the time that Nellie Bly returned to the United States, she was the most famous woman in America. The reason being that every single day in the pages of the world, they were promoting Nellie Bly. And they never mentioned Elizabeth Bislin, by the way. They were only talking about Nellie Bly. Every day, there was another article. Where is Nellie Bly today? What will Nellie Bly be seeing? Is she ahead of time? Is she behind time? And so forth. And then two weeks into the trip, they hit on this genius idea where someone came up, and nobody remembers who it is anymore, but it was an incredible marketing idea. They came up with the idea of the Nellie Bly guessing match, where they offered a free trip to Europe to the reader who came closest to guessing the final time of Nellie Bly's trip around the world in days, hours, uh, minutes, and seconds. Um, and people went crazy for this idea. It was like a free lottery. The lotteries were illegal in New York at that time. This was a lottery that they could enter. But it wasn't free, of course, because how did you enter? You had to buy a copy of the world, because inside the copy of the world was the entry form. By the time the race was over, the world had received almost a million entry forms for the Nellie Bly guessing match. And the person who won, uh, as it turns out, was off by two-fifths of a second. Um, the, the second place person was off by three-fifths of a second, so he lost his trip to Europe by a fifth of a second. But as a result of the Nellie Bly guessing match and the constant promotion in the world, which was the largest newspaper in the country, uh, Nellie Bly arrived uh, back in San Francisco, suddenly an extraordinarily famous person. And uh, that meant that in 1890, women all across the country were wearing Nellie Bly dresses uh, modeled on the single dress that she brought with her on her trip around the world. They were wearing Nellie Bly caps, Nellie Bly gloves. You could write with a Nellie Bly pen on Nellie Bly paper by the light of the Nellie Bly lamp. Um, there was Nellie Bly horse feed uh, put out in Syracuse, New York. Um, the most famous, or I should say the most popular board game of its time was called Around the World with Nellie Bly. And it was published by The World. And this is it. I happen to have a copy of it. Um, where you can, you go around the, the board rolling or spinning, I guess was spinning uh, an arrow, and eventually you try to return to New York. And by the way, in New York, the only visible building in the entire, uh, <laughs> the entire city of New York is the World Building. So uh, that was uh, another way that the world built up the uh, publicity value of their star reporter, Nellie Bly. Uh, th that celebrity, by the way, didn't turn out very well for Nellie Bly, but I won't anticipate, I won't anticipate that. As I mentioned, it was a race that uh, captivated the country and much of the world besides for two and a half months. It captivated me for the four years that I was working on this book, and I'm uh, delighted for the opportunity to uh, reintroduce a new generation of readers to Nellie Bly and to introduce them, perhaps, to uh, Elizabeth Bisland. So with that, I'll, I'll say thank you, and I'm happy to take questions from the crowd. Do you want to? Okay. I actually had a, had a question. I had a question for Matthew to start, and then I'll be happy to pick your questions. My question is, what's New York City about this topic? What is New York City about it? Yeah. Well, nothing. You see, it was a mistaken uh, uh, appearance by me at this uh, event. No. Uh, what is New York City about this topic? Well, uh, it's really a New York City story. It's a story in large part about the power of New York journalism. Um, uh, New, New York newspapers were dominant in the country, and the paper that Nellie Bly worked for was the most dominant of the papers in New York City at the time. Um, the tallest buildings, this is hard to imagine today at a time when newspapers are folding right and left, but the most powerful industry in New York at that time was the newspaper industry. And the tallest buildings in New York were all being built by newspapers as a way of asserting their power. So that the tallest building uh, had been the Tribune building, but then in 1890, 
Uh, Joseph Pulitzer built the, a taller building yet, the world building, this beautiful building, which unfortunately has been torn down, and we were instead given the beautiful j &R Music World building uh, on Park Row. But it was this glorious building with a golden dome at the top, and the world's editors delighted in the fact that they could lean out of the 22nd story of this building, and if they wanted to spit on the Sun building uh, directly below. Um, uh, the power, by the way, of Pulitzer was shown by the fact that the Statue of Liberty is even in New York Harbor. You know, the Statue of Liberty, France had built the Statue of Liberty, but it had been kind of sitting around because the Congress, the United States Congress, refused to pass money to build the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. And Pulitzer, who was an immigrant himself, thought that this was unacceptable. And he uh, took it upon himself to raise money to build the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty in the pages of the world. And he began a campaign to raise money. And the immigrant readers of the world sent in their pennies and nickels and dimes. And in a matter of months, they had, they had raised enough money to build the pedestal and to put the Statue of Liberty uh, in New York Harbor. And it stood there as a testament not just to liberty, but also to the power of New York's press, and in particular to the power of New York's immigrants. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Sure. OK, so questions from the audience? Yes, all the way in the back. Um, if neither newspaper wanted to mention the other woman, did anybody in the other newspaper talk about Jane Doe and the reaction to having Elizabeth? Ah, good question. That's a very good question. I'll, I'll take that second part first. Uh, when Nellie Bly set out from New York, she thought she was the only person racing, of course. And it wasn't until she was literally halfway around the world in Hong Kong that she even found out that there was someone else in the race. What happened was that she went to the, the, uh, the steamship office in Hong Kong, and the steamship officer there said to her, uh, you're going to lose. And Nellie Bly said, I don't think so. I'm ahead of my schedule. I don't think I'm going to lose. I'm ahead of time. And the guy said, uh, time, I don't think her name is time. And Nellie Bly said, what are you talking about? And he said, the other woman. And Nellie Bly said, what other woman? And he said, the, the, the woman who started for another newspaper. She was already here just a few days ago, and she's going to beat you. And that was the first time that Bly found out that she wasn't just racing against the, the calendar or against this fictional character, but against this very real uh, woman by the name of Elizabeth Bisland. And Nellie Bly, I should say, was none too pleased about the fact that this woman was racing against her. She was, she was deeply competitive, Nellie Bly. She was a very competitive person, uh, which is part of what made her a, uh, a good newspaper woman. But, uh, you know, for her, it was always a race. You know, she was constantly telling ships, the ship's captains, more steam, more steam, you know. And whenever she had to wait, you know, was delayed in uh, a particular place for more than a few hours, she was just desperate to get moving again. If it was up to her, she would have not stopped anywhere. She would have just gone straight all the way around the world to go as fast as she, she possibly could. And in fact, in the United States, back when she was, when she was on a railroad train going across the country, uh, an engineer who, of course, knew who she was, she was a celebrity by then, allowed her to actually run the train uh, across the West, across in Denver. And uh, she went faster than he let her go. Uh, you know, she just, you know, did the throttle as fast as she possibly could. That's the way that she was. She said on more than one occasion that she would rather die than return to New York behind time. For Elizabeth Bisland, you know, she was racing too, but this was really an opportunity for her to experience the world. She discovered this great love of travel. She had never been outside the country before, and she fell in love with the Far East. And she wrote a book about the trip later, um, in which I was, um, it was remarkable to me. She never once used the word race to describe her trip. She always referred to it as a journey or as a trip, um, never once as a race. Um, and I forgot the first part of the question. Oh, right. They were, right. Well, 
Uh, neither new, neither paper really was talking about the other one, but they were. But this was a race that was being covered in newspapers all across New York and all across the country. Um, so people knew knew for sure that it was a race, and there was constant speculation: Is Bly ahead right now? Is Bisland ahead right now? Um, there was a lot of gambling in America on who was going to win the race. There were gambling houses who were offering odds on on who would be the winner of the race. So it was generally understood that it was a race between uh, these two women. Yes. Did either of the women ever marry? Yes, these are very good questions. As a matter of fact, they both did marry. They both married millionaires. Um, it was one of the amazing, many amazing similarities between these two women, as I discovered in their later lives. They both married millionaires. They both served in Europe during World War I. They both died of pneumonia. They both were writers right up to the very end of their lives. And they both, amazingly, by pure coincidence, are both buried in Woodlawn Cemetery um, wow. in the Bronx. Wow. They're, bu- they're buried within a quarter mile of each other. And neither uh, one had any children, right? And neither one, and neither right, and neither one of them had any children. Wow. Yes. Um, with Millie Bly doing so many stunts, and I've seen copies of old newspapers, I don't know if there were pictures of her, but there were drawings of her. How did she escape detection? Right. You mean when she went under undercover? Uh, not really, but you know there were drawings of her, uh, but they were very vague and kind of indeterminate, and and people w- didn't really know. In, in the general in the general population, people didn't really know what Nellie Bly looked like until she came back from this race, and suddenly she was incredibly famous. And so famous, in fact, and so in demand that the the world newspaper, to further boost their circulation, began giving out free photographs of Nellie Bly with copies of the Sunday World, because people were so interested in her. Uh, But imagine that. They're giving out free photographs of their star undercover reporter. So really what happened was that Nellie Bly, and this is one of the the tragedies that befell Nellie Bly later in her life, she became too famous to do the kind of work that she was really best at uh, because she kept getting recognized when she tried to go undercover. And so she had to give up the kind of work that she most loved and was most successful at. Hmm. Yes. Right. Uh, Bislin did not get the kind of celebrity that Bly did for many reasons, one of which was that her, her publication, The Cosmopolitan, was a monthly as opposed to a daily, so they had less opportunity to promote her. They were also, since they were a literary magazine and they were in the sensationalist news business, a little bit more reticent about doing the kind of just sheer yellow journalism promotion uh, in the way that the world was doing on a, on a daily basis. That was part of it. The other part of it was that Nellie Bly sought out celebrity um, in a way that Elizabeth Bislett did not. When Nellie Bly got back, she immediately left on a 40-city lecture tour around the country. Um, she, uh, she, she, she promoted herself. And there are reasons why, which I discuss in the book. You know, she she was born poor. She you know she she was raised poor. She was supporting her mother. It was very important for her that she was had an independent source of, of of money. Uh, Bisland, on the other hand, was not interested in celebrity at all. And when she got back to New York, when the public's attention, uh, when the public's interest in her was at its height, she immediately left and went and sailed back to England and lived in England for a year to escape the glare of publicity. And she lived there and she wrote a novel while she was there and that's where Rudyard Kipling fell in love with her um, and so forth. Um, So she deliberately avoided celebrity and uh, tried to disassociate herself from this trip later in life. Her obituary never even mentioned the, the, uh, the race around the world. Wow. She's a beautiful writer, by the way. All of her books are out of, sadly out of print. She wrote a beautiful novel called A Candle for Understanding. She wrote uh, incredible essay collections. The, the, most, the latest one 
meaning the last one she wrote just before she died is called The Truth About Men and Other Matters, um, which I would love to see be put back into print. It's well worth, well worth reading. Hmm. Yes. Did they follow pretty much the same um, route around the world in the one with one with, I mean, was it set? I mean, it's been a lot of years since I've been around the world in days. Right. And I figured, okay, Bob made certain stops, right. traveling in certain ways. Did they follow the novel, or were there clever ways to get around it? Were there rules? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> right. Uh, good Vern, another good question. Um, Vern wrote his book in 1873. And by the time they were doing this route in 1889, there were changes that they could make to speed up the trip. Um, so they didn't do exactly the same route that Phileas Fogg did. And in fact, when uh, Nellie Bly met Jules Verne, she took great pleasure. He showed her the actual map, wor the world map on the wall that he had plotted out the route that Phileas Fogg took. And they sort of discussed where her, her trip diverge from that of Phileas Fogg. I don't know if you remember this in the book, but he goes across India by train and he ends up rescuing an Indian maiden by the name of Aouda, who's going to be sacrificed. And um, when when Vern and his wife meet Nellie Bly, they say to her, why are you not traveling across India? And she says, because I'm more interested in saving time than in saving an Indian maiden, um, which they were delighted by. Um, and his his wife, Honorine, said, you may find a husband yet. Um, but And in fact, she was proposed to, this is a whole other story, but she was proposed to seven times over the course of the uh, huh. of the, the, the trip. Um, the, the two routes that Bly and Bislin took are similar. The, the ma there's actually a map on the uh, front it's a, piece. It's a great book. map. It's a really um, good map. It is a good map. So, but there, for various reasons, they, they did diverge slightly. They both had to improvise their routes slightly over the course of the race when ships didn't, sailings didn't work out quite the way that they had intended. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Uh, that's part of what befell Nellie Bly afterwards, was that when she was racing around the world and she was doing it for America, and, uh, you know, people would say, you know, this is, this is an example of American pluck. You know, this, is, this, this, this shows the American spirit that we're able to beat this Englishman. You know, she was trying to beat an Englishman, Phileas Fogg, who had been invented by a Frenchman. Jules Verne. So this was considered like a great American achievement if she could do it. Um, you know, ignoring the fact that she was doing it on British and German steamships. She was crossing the Suez Canal, which was owned by the British and uh, invented or created by a Frenchman on the Transcontinental Railroad that had been built by Chinese laborers who were not being granted American citizenship and so forth. But um, having said that, um, she was celebrated when she was doing it. But when she came back to America and she set out on this 40 city lecture tour, suddenly people, particularly men, were not so thrilled with her anymore. The idea that she would presume to speak for an entire evening to a mixed group, uh, people found very upsetting, men found very upsetting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, would say things like, she should, uh, we pity the man who uh, she marries, you know, that she's so talkative, you know, that kind of, that, that kind of thing. So there definitely was a backlash um, against her later. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. When she left New York, when she left <clears throat> Hoboken, there was a, a man from the New York Athletic Club there with a stopwatch. And the moment that the ship, the ship's horn sounded, the stopwatch began. And when she arrived back in New Jersey, the instant that her uh, second foot hit the ground, there were three men there now, uh, two men from the New York Athletic Club and one from a different club, I forget what, uh, did their stopwatch and they took the mean average of the three, the three times uh, down to the fraction of the second. So that's how they determined, determined that. Hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, they were using passports. They were basically traveling uh, through British, British and American territory. Um, so they were using American passports um, at the time. Um, that's part of the reason why they chose the route that they did was that it was already, it was already kind of well marked out because these were all British colonies, you know, Penang, uh, Hong Kong, or uh, Yokohama, Hong Kong, and so forth were, you know, British territories, uh, Port Said, and so forth. Um, and what was the, the first part of the question? Of, oh, did they get sick? They got seasick. No, they didn't, but they got seasick. Uh, terribly, terribly seasick. Um, Nellie Bly, in particular, got horrendously seasick on her first, uh, her first trip. Seasickness was um, a common topic of conversation and writing among travelers at the time. They called it the green monster. And I have a whole section in the book about the various remedies that people had prescribed for dealing with seasickness, one of which was cannabis, uh, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, another was knockout drops, was uh, a remedy for seasickness. But they both, they both suffered from seasickness, Bly especially, but they, neither one got terribly sick over the course of the, the trip. Yes. <sighs> from your lips to 20th Century Fox's uh, ears, uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, there's, there's been a little bit of interest from Hollywood, but you never know about that, you know, of course I spent my time in my spare moments casting the movie, you know, in my head, um, uh, John Turturro as Joseph Pulitzer and so forth, um, but, um, they did not actually ever meet, their ships, they were, their ships literally passed in the night, uh, in the South China Sea, their two ships passed, but they hadn't met before the race because they were traveling in very different circles in New York. They lived actually near each other. Nellie Bly lived on the west side. Elizabeth Bissell lived on the east side within a few blocks of each other, but they were operating in very different circles. And then after the race, you know, Bislin didn't really want to be too associated with the race and Bly really despised Bisland, uh, because of, you know, what she felt that Bisland was trying to capitalize on her idea and so forth. And in fact, at one point, mm -hmm. Bly began to kind of spread some ugly rumors, uh, false rumors about Elizabeth Bisland. So it doesn't seem the, that the two had ever met, which is part of the irony of the fact that they're both buried so close to each other. Yes. Yes, they were <clears throat> sending back very brief um, uh, reports of their progress. You know, when they, when they got to a port, they would immediately set out for the Western Union office to report back, have made it to Brindisi at such and such a time, and so forth. But in terms of sending back dispatches, they would write them out, Nellie Bly did, and then would send them back to the world, but they would have to go by ship. And so that would take some weeks, so that the world's readers were always several weeks late in terms of their reading of Nellie Bly's dispatches, you know, that they might be reading about her time in Italy, by which time she was already in Hong Kong, or, or, or so forth. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they bo both women wrote uh, quite wonderful books about the race. Nellie Bly's was... Uh, called Around the World in 72 Days, and, uh, and Bislin's book was called A Flying Trip Around the World. And their personality, their very divergent personalities really come out in the writing of, of these two books. Yes. Uh, the Nellie Fly Amusement Park was uh, just off the Belt Parkway uh, in Bath Beach, um, sort of South Brooklyn. It's still there, there's still an amusement park there. But it's not called the Nellie Bly Amusement Park anymore. It's called like the Great Adventure or something, amusement, something like that. That's a very good question. I don't know the exact answer to that. My set, Nellie Bly did live for a while in Brooklyn. She had a Brooklyn connection or she had, she owned property in Brooklyn. Um, and my sense of it, I actually never went to the amusement park myself, but my sense of it was that it had a kind of around the world theme to it. Um, and, and so it was sort of a logical thing that they would name it after her. There was also a, the tr a train, the Nellie Bly Special. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but the, the Nellie Bly Special ran up until the 1960s from, it, it was the express train that ran from Atlantic City to New, New York. Wow. What's that? It was a very rough bar. 
Is that right? I really? never knew that. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Bisland didn't take 11 steamer trunks, but she did carry a bit more than Bly did. She carried, she had one steamer trunk, and then she had um, a satchel that she carried with her, and then she had something called a shoulder strap, which was something that was in use in the Victorian era that you would use, that you would carry the kind of the long things like umbrellas and stuff that wouldn't fit into your regular luggage. So she had three pieces of luggage where Bly had, had just the one. Yes. Yes, certainly. I mean, Bly was a great inspiration to to female journalists. Absolutely, and in fact, you know, she died without much money. And when she was buried in uh, Woodlawn, there was, she had no headstone. She's she's buried in kind of the poor part of Woodlawn. Uh, it's sort of, it looks like a tenement there. There are like a lot of graves all, you know, very close to each other. Um, and she didn't ha even have a headstone until the 1970s when the female members of the New York Press Club banded together to raise money to, to provide a headstone for her because they recognized her as being kind of an inspirational female reporter. Um, after Bly uh, became well known, suddenly there were a lot of women who were doing this kind of thing, undercover investigative work. They became known as stunt girls. Um, and they did a lot of important work. They did some kind of frivolous work. The world, well, uh, Bly quit the world in a dispute with money with Pulitzer after the race was over is one of the tragedies that kind of befell her. So she wasn't writing for the world anymore. And so the world brought on a new uh, undercover reporter by the name of Meg Merrilies, who would do things like get shot in the chest by a bullet to test uh, the new right. body arm, you know, uh, bulletproof vests. Uh, or, you know, go down to the bottom of New York Harbor with in a scuba, with scuba gear and things like that. As it turned out, there was no Meg Merrilies. Meg Merrilies was a composite of many different women, all of whom wrote under the name Meg Merrilies because the world had had enough of famous women like Nellie Bly trying to leverage their celebrity into more money. And if they have kind of an assembly line of nameless women doing these tasks, then they can pay them much less. So, so that was that was the world. Wow. Last last question right here. Did they travel with staff? No. No, they were all by them they were by themselves the whole way. Thank you all so much and please buy the book and Matthew will be happy to sign it Thank for you. you. Thank you so much.